I'm Pat Simone from Fresno, California in the San Joaquin Valley. Today my guest is Daniel from Fresno Farm Bureau and Wolf Packing Farm Company. I'm Daniel Hartwig. Uh, my, uh, I'm 40 years old here. I'm president of the Fresno County Farm Bureau mm -hmm. and uh, grown up in the valley all my life. Uh, worked for Wolf Farming and have been there about seven and a half years. Uh, managed some water, regulatory, sustainability, all the fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> basically oh, yeah. there. Uh, worked with my brother as well. We have a farm uh, together. We grow grapes and almonds, uh, grow some, on some of my dad's ground. And uh, been doing that now about uh, five years, but I've wow. been farming, farming pretty much all my life. Yeah, so you're doing things all the time. I mean, you're working from <laughs> dusk until dawn, really. Try, I try not to. I try to save some time for my family as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so you get a little time in there. So what are your responsibilities as president? For for uh, for Wolf Farm, or I'm sorry, for Fresno, uh, for, for Fresno County Farm Bureau. Yeah, uh, really, it's just to represent agriculture and and help us to make good good choices, good decisions, help lead the organization, uh, making sure that we are representing our farms, making sure our farmers are represented, our ranchers are represented as well. Uh, whether that's, you know, in terms of regulatory uh, things, you know, at the air district right. uh, with water situations, uh, to be a, a spokesperson uh, for ah. for our farms and, yeah. and ranches and everything. So you are a hands-on president. I, I try to be. I mean, we, we're, good. yeah, we're, I mean, we're really blessed, right? We have a, right. we have a great, great, you know, a director or CEO Absolutely. Uh, in Ryan Jacobson and, uh -huh. and, and he's tremendous, tremendous resource. Oh yeah. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's good to have multiple people that are that are able to get out and speak and on behalf of our, our county. Right. So you have a very unique thing. Well, like like me and everybody else, where your forefathers came from, what they were Germans and and mm -hmm. migrated from Russia and go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, no, my my so my great uh, my great grandparents on, on my dad's side. Uh, we, I I grew up living like a quarter mile away from my my great grandma. Yeah, that's uh, cool. And she, you know, she migrated, uh, you know, so they were Volga River uh, Germans. Uh, That's a big river. Yeah, it's a huge river. Yeah, it right? goes all the way, I looked at it, it goes all the way through Russia. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, no, that was, I believe it was Catherine the Great, actually, that uh, that, wow. that that encouraged, you know, the German people that were known as good farmers, yeah. uh, encouraged them to move to that area to help, you know, bolster, sure. uh, you know, the agricultural uh, resources of Russia. Uh, back, I think, in the 1700s, and then those a large group of them, you know, moved, started migrating here in the in the early 1900s, late 1800s, and moved to the valley uh, to do the same thing to pick up farming. And, right, and so that's that's kind of my family origin story on 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 that side of the family. Right, you, you know, my relatives did the same thing. Now let's go back to those days. It was extremely difficult to migrate here. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean. They came, you know, I did all the genealogy stuff and went to Ellis Island. I, did they go to Ellis Island? I, I don't Do actually you know. know. I, I, I never did. have. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. But. Did. So what happened is, is they all, I looked at the manifest and they, at, actually they had nuns. So German origin, Russian origin, the nuns would have had to speak um, German or Russian mm -hmm. for them to communicate you know what are you who are you what's your name okay so the same thing was um my forefathers came from italy same thing so I'm, I'm looking at the manifest and it says what do you do on it and it's like farmer farmer everybody was farmers mm -hmm. or they cut hair or they were carpenters <laughs> really? that was it really yeah that was it so you know how did they get here so i remember talking to my grandfather and said how did you get here and he said why well, i got here on a boat yeah. I said, what do you mean a boat? So and he couldn't really explain it. He was seven when he came in here with a few brothers. And I, I did all this genealogy, and here's the ship, okay? So I'm like, oh, ship. So And they were like, well, a lot of them burned up, so you couldn't see the exact ship. But I found mm -hmm. his exact ship. It didn't burn. And actually, it was a sail ship. Really? Yeah. And it was steam. Okay. So you can imagine... They got wood in that thing, mm -hmm. okay? They're, and you've got fire and sail. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't go. No, not very right. well, no. So people were, I mean, and it took like, if you were lucky, it took three weeks. Mm -hmm. You had to bring your food with you. And so can you imagine how tough those people were? 
it's 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 amazing to think about the fortitude that they have to have and the and the the want to to, to have a better life right, right. i mean to, to absolutely to, to think about america and what that idea meant to them yeah I'm sure. they had no idea they probably heard the same way you hear things oh you could do this and do anything you want and become and, and get land and everything and it's all on the come line they had to just i mean it was just like you, now you got to walk 200 miles to get to the port and he, so so they told my grandfather he was just a kid and, and he said all the old, old guys they said you can't go in the middle of the ship and he says what do you mean he goes well that's where the ship opens up and it swallows you oh jeez there was some, and he was like so the whole time 3 weeks he was always walking around <laughs> the ship instead the perimeter yeah. of the thing just the perimeter so of the <laughs> ship instead of that so i i mean you know th then they had to get here and you got here and you spoke, you know, broken whatever to these people, and they didn't know. So I mean, it was just, it was so difficult for those people. You know, they had to come here on horse. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like you got in a car and just drove to the port and meow. Yeah. You know, so so it was pretty difficult. Well, I mean, a lot of those folks too. I mean, they came with the sh you know shirts on their back, right? And or they or they had to earn the money, even if you landed in Ellis Island. Absolutely. I mean, that that's three thousand miles away still. Yeah. Do you then what? Yeah. You know. So so and most of them, like you know, we were talking about your family. Every, most of the families around here, they were all farmers. Mm -hmm. So they came here and got jobs working for somebody, made a little bit of money, bought their own land if they didn't have enough. Most of them had had to you know go that way and everything. So. You as your progression goes through, you um, you went to Fresno State, I did. right? Yeah. And, and tell me about Fresno State and what you did. So I actually I started out at uh, Davis for a year after I graduated high school, oh. and and then I uh, was up there and like I said, Davis kind of an ag school as well, right. but uh, just wasn't a great fit for me. Um, so decided to to come back uh, to to Fresno State. And, you know, I didn't actually really necessarily want to go back into ag. Um, yeah. I, you know, at the time when I was in high school and, and things were kind of tough you know, oh, for yeah. a little while, my, my dad was trying to talk me out of ag a little bit. That's what my dad did too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you want, you you know, you want, if you want to, you know, do something, you know, go, go to law school or something like that. Be, right. You know, be, you know, fine. That's <laughs> what I did with my son. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. and, uh, but the darndest thing is I, I just kept being, you know, drug, kind Strong. of drugged back to ag. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I started out taking, you know, just a regular econ classes, regular, you know, classes like that. And I was like, you know what? This stuff all transfers into agriculture. I can still do it. And I so after a year at Fresno State like that, I transferred back into the ag program and uh, did that and was working on the farm the whole time. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and like I said, it's just funny how it just kind of, you know, just when you thought they were out, they you know, they pull you back in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and, th and that was kind of the, the sense was, you know, this is where I belong. So it's interesting. Yeah, you had a calling to it and everything. So you got your B.A.? Yeah, I did. I got my yeah. uh, actually I got or BS. I think it is an agricon, yes, and yeah. then uh, and then I uh, went straight from there. Actually, I uh, went straight into my MBA into the MBA program there as well. Yeah. Uh, so you know, another two years or so, and and finished that MBA still while working on the farm, and it was then it was like, no, I need to probably find something you know off the farm, off of my dad's farm, uh, my grandpa's farm, just you know, just to kind of broaden my horizons sure. a little bit, right? I mean, just you know, know how other people do things, and and you know, kind of learn other practices. Right. Uh, and actually went to work, uh, briefly for the city, which is where I did my MBA project, uh, worked for the city of Fresno, you know, for a little bit, uh, just, they asked me to stay on as an intern there, did that for a little bit. And then I went to work down for a uh, Paramount Citrus, uh, which is now wonderful citrus, uh, down yeah. in Delano. So, so yeah, that's a, that's one of the biggest citruses in the United States, as far as I know. Yeah. They're, if, as my memory serves, they were, it was the largest citrus, you know, packing house, largest right. packing house in the, in the world. So the what'd you do for that? Uh, I was an analyst. I, what does that mean? Uh, basically, I cord I took you know I did a lot of computer stuff, right? So oh. I I would take and coordinate the harvest and and you know kind of build some metrics uh, to you know take harvest, translate when that's going to be ready to pack, uh, make sure then the sales team has that information so they kind of could see the ebbs and flows uh, of the you know the pack out and what that was going to look like and and maybe how to do some pricing, how to do some advanced sales. Yeah. Uh, and did that for for about a year, and I was there, and I, I enjoyed the work there, uh, but I fell in love. Yeah. So I, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You get you get into it and fall in love with it. Yeah. Then you went to a, an interesting place. They call it the NFL. Yeah. Because the, their name is so. It's a Japanese mm -hmm. name, right? Yeah. How do you pronounce that? Nisei. 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 Yeah. yeah. I, I knew it, but I don't know how you do it. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, I, I was looking into them. I didn't even know they existed. Really? Yeah, I had no clue. Okay. 
And and uh, I saw that and I went, oh, that was neat, you know. So I looked into that and everything. So they're about what you can you, you can explain. Them sure. So Nisei Farmers League was actually started by you know a group of, of folks to help uh, Japanese Americans. Japanese Americans yeah. and that and Nisei actually means the first. It's the first generation uh, that was you know born here. Right. Uh, their parents you know immigrated and then they were the first generation of there was Issei and then Nisei was the first generation here. Um, and that and the organization started really as a way to kind of combat against the uh, UFW, uh, which is you know kind of a, a verboten you know word around oh, the, yeah. around agriculture at least you know back then especially. Oh, yeah. Uh, now we, you know, now we work with them a little bit more sure. on some immigration things and things like that. But back then, uh, there was a, a oh, it was heck, different. <laughs> it was, was a big gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a heck of a lot of animosity back in those days. Yeah, uh, back in the early '70s when the when the league started. I remember that? Yeah, yeah. And it was, I mean, it was it was it was a big deal. And so uh, there was a lot of uh, tactics that were being used, you know, by the union at that point. Um, so they started things called night patrols and things like that to make sure that, you know, any vandalization and things like that of a farmer's property, yeah. uh, weren't taking place. Really, it was a way to patrol That's to, to prevent that. That's a big deal. Yeah. Vandalization. Yeah. There was, I mean, oh. there's, there's some tremendous, now. well now, especially, but I mean, back then there, I mean, there were times when the, the, the folks in the, on the union side was, you know, would put jacks out and puncture, you know, farmers tires for their tractors or Yeah, they hated know. the farmers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> or go out and like literally cut down entire orchards or vineyards and things like that. Is that right? Yeah. I, mean, I never heard about that. No, there and a lot of people haven't, but there but if you go actually there there's, you know, not a they have uh really, you know, a nice history at the at the league of, you know, some of these things back in the early 70s. Um, pictures of, of all this stuff that was going on, um, and this league, you know, it's a, it's called a mutual benefit uh, organization. That was how they, you know, did it. So yeah. they could help police and protect the farmers oh, yeah. uh, from from all those, you know, all the all the vandalizing oh, that yeah. was going on. Oh, I so. remember that. It, uh, pumps too. I mean, people yeah. just take pumps. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, water irrigation systems are really, you know, it, the metal and everything. And there's. There's a lot still going on. But, but yeah, and I don't think it's quite as organized now. I think it, now it's a little more uh, just no good nicks, I guess, if you would, or something yeah. like that, do, doing that kind of stuff. But People uh, go, and they'll take whole crops. Yeah. They just go pick a crop yeah. at night. Yeah. How do a, you, you know, it's like you come to work and, oh, my crop's gone. I was, yeah. we were driving home the other day. We, my son had a baseball tournament in, uh, in Hanford and we were driving, I drove home. I like to take the scenic route. So we came down Fowler Avenue and I, it was Sunday and I saw people just, wasn't like a crew of cars that were supposed to be there. It was a, one car parked and you see all guys out there with plastic bags and somebody's, you know, stone fruit orchard, just, you know, filling their bags. Oh up. yeah. And you're just like, you know. <laughs> We caught a lady once, and she was out. She had a five-gallon bucket. And my dad drives up, and he's telling me all about this because he, he hated all the theft, you know. And she's filling it up with figs. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah, dollar, dollar a fig, you know. And, and she's got like half a five-gallon bucket, and she's carrying it. And he, he stopped me. He says, hey, he says, where do you live? And she goes, oh, right here. He goes, well, you know, I'm going to go in your house with you and I'm going to go in your refrigerator and I'm going to empty out all your food. And she's like, what are you talking about? He goes, that's what you're doing here. Yeah. yeah. You know? And she was like, well, I thought because it's here, I can. No, yeah. that's not the way things are. But people do that. And that's a big thing with residential fruit. Yeah. Yeah. You especially know? if you're lo located close to town or anything like that. It's, oh, it's, <laughs> I, well, I lived out in close, uh, close to Wallona, mm -hmm. you know, and it out there it's just unbelievable yeah you know, everyone, that's my fruit too yeah it's, no <laughs> it's not your fruit you the, the, the thing of it is is most farmers if you i mean if you went and asked and you you know and, you, and i mean if you asked they'd probably give you a little bit or something they used too. To, it's, yeah. yeah i mean if they yeah. if, if they knew you needed it or you know something like that but i mean folks are going in and just taking you know, without asking, I mean, you don't know, I mean, from a safety perspective, you don't know if there's, you know, if there's equipment in the field or right. other people, or, you know, if you had to do a, you know, a, an application of some sort out there, it, it's for their own safety. Why you, why you should avoid going into somebody else's field if you don't know what's going on. Yeah. It's, yeah. So, so then, um, you, you went from uh, the NFL and then you went to Wolf. Yeah. 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 Right? Wolf's a cool deal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're big. 
Mm -hmm. and, and they've got a lot of uh, growing power and everything. Now, what do you do for them? So I'm my title is a resource manager. Okay. So it's kind of a wide ranging catch all kind of a kind you wear of a, a bunch thing. of hats. Yeah, I, I I do. I mean, sometimes not by choice. But, yeah, uh, but I know. This, yeah. this morning, for instance, the air conditioners you know stop. This is the thing about agriculture, right? You have to be a jack of all trades. Right. So the, the air conditioner stopped working in the office this morning. We're trying to figure out how to keep how to keep things cool for. Yeah. For, for all for everybody you know in, yeah. in the office and everything like that and that's you know i could spend half my day you know out trying to organize and you know make sure that you know for if, if we're you know you know for, if we've got an orchard that's coming out making sure that that's organized and we got the right people in the right places and and everybody's doing everything there uh and then i might be sitting in front of a computer trying to figure out how much water do we have you know right. which right now is kind that's of that's a big thing yeah there yeah. there's not a whole lot you know floating around out there yeah. so we'll get into that yeah a bit, you know <laughs> Um, you guys do mostly, well, you do almonds, you know, I, mm -hmm. I was looking at your, but you do some specialty cool stuff. You do, uh, you know, you, you do, uh, almond paste. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, protein powder. Yeah. Which yeah. is really neat. Yeah. Because I'm in a, I, I'm in a, you know, protein powder and stuff. I drink, you know, protein shakes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, almonds are really good. Yeah, you know, for protein source. Well, and they're right? so they're so. I mean, they're they're just so versatile, right? You can do so many different things with it with a nut like that. Right, right. It, it, it's a neat thing that they're doing. They're doing the paste, the almond oil, the sweet almond oil, and everything. So, um, you also do tomatoes, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you do the tomato paste for the ketchups, the pasta sauce, uh, pizza sauce, and. Yeah. And everything. Yeah. I mean, like I said, the tomato and tomatoes are versatile as well. I mean, we, you know, we, we grow a whole host of different things out there. I right. mean, but the, yeah, the tomatoes, it's a big part of it. So Wolf is, is partners in, you know, Harris Wolf almonds as well, right. which, you know, makes a lot of those products that you were describing. Yeah. Uh, we're also partners in uh, Los Gatos tomato as well, right. uh, which is a big supplier for Heinz as right. well. And so, um, yeah, I mean, if you if you've bought a you know bottle of Heinz ketchup, there's a there's a pretty darn high likelihood that some of our tomatoes you know from our farm right. are probably actually in that uh, that you know that packet of ketchup or the. Do you know how many tons it takes to make all that ketchup? I mean, there's a lot of ketchup to be made. There, there is. I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what that, right. uh, what those figures, you know, how that translates down. But, uh, but no, it's, it's enormous. <laughs> whatever it is. Oh, it is. I mean, like I said, there. I mean, there, the industry itself. I think people don't really realize how much you know how many tomatoes you know they are know. grown in, in the valley but i mean you're you're looking at probably 12 million tons right you know being grown just you know in in california alone right so and it's it's a big supplier yeah i couldn't believe the sweet beet deal how many sweet beets mm. you know go go in it, it it's incredible for sugar and stuff um and then you're involved with um Cal West Rain irrigation. Yeah, what's yeah. that all about? So Cal West Rain is just—I mean, there it's a pump company and it's an irrigation design company as well. So uh, you know, it's a big part of our of our water savings is, sure. is working with those guys. And you know, we really want to make sure that we are preserving and, and you know using our resources as effectively as we can. So you know, they help us design things like our buried irrigation systems. Which I don't know if you're familiar with those, but yeah, I mean, go ahead and explain. Yeah, so I mean, so all of our, almost all of our row crops now have been converted over to uh, all of our tomatoes for sure, and our cotton, uh, and and most, and we've grown wheat for years as well, and that had slowly been converted as well. Uh, but it's basically it's drip line that's buried about a foot, a foot and a half under the soil, right under the bed itself. Uh, so you, you basically don't lose anything to evaporation. There's you know it reduces the amount, the mold that's you know that's, uh, that would come up in a tomato bed. Uh, all these different things, and it just helps us get our water usage down. Sure. And as we you know go through you know some of our sustainability metrics and, and start measuring how we compare to other you know other growers, that's a really big component. Is you know can we you know save more water compared to to you know what's going on in the industry? Right. So that that's that's a big part of the Cal West you know piece of it uh, is them uh, you know helping us to make sure the systems are designed properly. People don't realize they. You know, and I just read a, you know, it was really a poor written uh, piece in, in our local newspaper. Mm -hmm. and, and it was about, you know, a waste of water. And farmers are the best stewards of water there is, period. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I can't, I, I, I can't imagine 
I just don't understand the the perception. I think all it would take is just a visit to out to to just about any farm to to see you know all the steps that farmers take to to preserve and oh. and, and I mean because at the end of the day water water is expensive right, right. it's, a, oh, it's yeah. a really expensive you know resource and oh, so yeah. we have to use a certain amount of water to grow our crops there's sure. just you know there there is a a, a minimum a, basically a minimum threshold right. that you, you that can't, you can't get grow, away with right that yeah. you can't grow a crop if unless you put some bare minimum there but it's too expensive to be just throwing it out there kind of willy nilly. And right. so, you know, every, every time you irrigate and you're talking, you know, you know, at least, you know, a couple hundred you know dollars per acre foot of water that you're putting on there. Right. You don't want to be wasting that because no, you got to see that. That's, that's the deal. I mean, there's so many steps that can go incrementally wrong, which will destroy your whole probability. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. And people have to have, you got to make money to farm. Yeah. For any okay. business. Yeah, for any business. Yeah. Exactly. And, and But food you have to have. Mm -hmm. you got to have a couple things in life. Air, food, and water, right? Yeah. You can't eat microchips, <laughs> you know, and people think you can, I guess. But, and, and you know, they, they have an outlook of farmers like it used to be in the old days when we were kids. It was like row crop, man. You just went and opened up the ditch, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and just flood, just flooded the acreage with water. And that was the way you farm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You didn't, there was no, I mean, there was still science involved, right? But, the, the, but at the time you probably didn't have that same mentality that we have now. Right. It's right. A, it's a different, it's a different generation and, and like everything. We, we, I mean, cars have gotten more fuel efficient. Uh, everything gets more efficient sure. at, through time, and like I said, but but now there's so much science involved in. Oh, in absolutely. Farming. Well, there's regu You guys got regulations. Farm. There's more regu. I mean, you have to have an onboard attorney. Yeah. To just, understand just, no. all this stuff and communicate this stuff to you, and it's constantly always changing in the political realm. Mm -hmm. Am I correct in that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we when I was working for uh, for Nisei Farmers League, that, I mean, we did analysis. That's what, just, yeah. I mean, we we looked at it one time, and it was in the course of a year. You as a farmer, you might run into. I think if I remember right, because this has been about ten years ago since we did this, but I think it was eighty nine different you know different agencies that you, that a grower might have to interact with on any you know in any given year. <laughs> Eighty nine regulatory you know bodies that you yeah. might have to deal with, and it, and it's just how do you deal with that? How do you do that? I it, well, it, I I was reading an article that we have in Sacramento a thousand EPA guys that they don't even know where they are, <laughs> and they're paying them right. They're sending a check to their house. They don't even know if they're working or not, you know. And it's like we we're over regulated and and, and but there's no regulation. Nobody's watching. The, and then if they get you, oh, it's for, you know. <laughs> I, I, I was at a, uh, in Radley. And the guy got kind of, he got kind of weird with me. And, and uh, I was there and I got hit with the cloud of ammonia mm -hmm. from the, you know, cold storage. I don't know if anyone ever understand. That'll knock you out. Mm -hmm. It'll kill you, you know. And I got hit with it, and I went, whoa. And I went and told the guy, I said, hey, you got a leak. Well, that means something mm -hmm. bad. Yeah. You know, it, it's really bad. And you're supposed to call all these regulatory. This was a long time ago, and the guy looked at me, and I went, hey, I'm just telling you. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you need to take care of this. You know, and he was looking at me like I was going to turn him into the regulatory system, and they'd come and shut you down, and all kind of really bad things. Right, happen, right, right, yeah. You know, I was... Reading the steel, Zaki Farms had a leak out there, and they were watching the cloud actually go over things. They were able to monitor it, and it was like, "Whoa, you know, that's a really nasty deal." Yeah, yeah. no, that's 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 terrifying. I mean, the thing, the thing of it is, is I mean, farmers have just come so far in, in, the, in the things that we're doing. I mean, like any industry, I mean, there there are, I'm sure that there's bad actors out there, but I mean, you can't you shouldn't paint that broad of a brush, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, the, the 98% of people that are doing things the right way shouldn't get tarred and feathered for, you know, for the, for the bad couple people. That Exa are, yeah. 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 There's, there's very few, but there's so many re regulatory functions. You got to have sensors and all kind of things, you know? Yeah. I mean, especially now with, I mean, as we get to in the Sigma and the, the sustainable groundwater, you know, management acts and everything like that, um, I mean, there, there's just so many more things. It, it's kind of funny. We were, you know, we farm in Westlands and we've been monitoring every ounce of water we put on, you know, for, for, I mean, since be, way before I even came on board. Right. And, you know, now 
and we and we had these sensors on there that told us you know really how efficient were our pumps running uh you know based on the flow rates and sure. things like that i mean there's a lot of calculations that go into it but it's funny now with sigma uh, you know, the, the, you know, Westlands is putting on their own water meters and yeah. they're, they're taking our meters off of there, but we can't hook in necessarily to, to get their data, which means now we don't have as much data as we had before. Yes, yeah, so you can't monitor <laughs> your data, but they can monitor their data. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I used to be able to, I could sit on, I could pull up on my computer and look and say, Oh, Hey, this pump is dropping in efficiency, right? It's, uh, you know, the efficiency is going down. Maybe we need to, you know, take a look at it and, you know, and, and, and come out and get a pump test and see all these things. It's basically you have a real time pump test going on. Um, and now I don't have that ability anymore. To so you can't, there's no, they just, they just come and they go over your existing. No. So they put their own meters on. So, I mean, we've had, you know, but you can't have both. We could put a second set on. It's right. just, I mean, now we've got to drill another hole and More, then maybe yeah. the pipe's not long enough to, to get an effective reading. I mean, there's all these little nuances that happen. Yeah. And it's funny because we were taking all these steps, but now you have somebody coming in and making you actually, you know, less efficient than you, than you were before, basically. You know, I've been involved in these things and in Sacramento, and they don't even understand how your the farmers are going to do it. They just say we're going to do this, and they don't they don't know how you're going to deal with it. Yeah. You yeah. know, like you're saying, you know, you got to do all these switches, and that we don't we don't care. We're yeah. just going to do this. Yeah. You know. No, it's 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 amazing how disconnected I think people are from their food system in general. But especially, you know, I I always encourage people. I mean, I think the the regulating community is so disconnected sometimes. It's actually really good to bring them on farm. I know people get really you know queasy about bringing yeah. you know re, you know the regulatory community out onto the farm, but it's actually really good. And we've actually done a lot of good by bringing folks onto the farm, explaining to them, showing to them. Because I think they have this perception. I remember this story, you know, from a few years back. You know, uh, one of the state legislators came came on the, to a neighbor's farm, and they, you know, they wanted to. They were like, "Hey, can I go talk to one of your employees?" And it's like, "Yeah, no worries, or whatever." Yeah. Well, do you do you want to do you want to come with us or whatever or something like that? It's like, <laughs> no, you can go ask them whatever you want. I yeah. mean, we, but the legislator. I mean, this is this is somebody that actually is an elected official. You know, in the state California state legislature, that felt like they were concerned. That they that we were worried that you that they were going to talk to our employees. It's like we we're we're fine. You you can go talk to our people. We we have nothing to yeah. hide. You need to talk to us a lot more. Yeah. Before you go and do these yeah. things. So well, you we, get. I mean, yeah. You think about things like I mean, where where they want to you know change the hours, right? They you know you lose the sixty hour work week. You know, and now we're in the harvest, and it's a it's a huge crunch. But the employees didn't want to lose the hours. They you know they they voted on this stuff. And we tried to bring employees and to talk to the, you know, to, to talk and, and, you know, raise their concerns to our legislating community, but they don't, they don't want to hear the story. They don't want to hear something that kind of shakes no. their, their, you know, preconceived notion of what's going on. Right. And the employees are ticked off now at, you know, at, at, at their employers saying, yeah, well, we hey, didn't what, do it. Yeah, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. well, we, you know, we wanted you guys to be able to work more. We yeah. want to be able to cover more ground and do these things. But I think the legislators sometimes just don't want to hear what they don't want to, what they don't believe to be yeah. true. See, that, that's part of the reason why I started this podcast to educate people mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, not only, you know, other farmers see what's going on with other farmers, but people, you know, like 4-H and stuff. And, you know, pe people understand what's really going on mm -hmm. and, and what, you know, the changes we need to make and everything. But yeah, I, I hear you on a lot of that. It, it, it's it's your typical legislation bureaucrat. And, well, but you, you but know. you talk about 4-H. I mean, you think about the funding that's now disappearing from 4-H and FFA programs as well. I mean, that's I mean, those are not necessarily people that are going to grow up to be farmers, but I mean, but they're but they're just good resources for a community. Yeah. And, right. and programs like 4-H just bring a community together. Absolutely. So yeah, you went through 4-H. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So how many years is that? So I mean I think if I remember right and and forgive me because I'm getting no, <laughs> getting older and yeah. I can't remember for sure. You but know I, more than I do. About yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I was nine when I started 4-H. Right? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was, you could you know start showing animals and things like that. Yeah. And so I was you know nine and I did it all the way up until I got into high school and then I you know the sports kind of takes over and you you just don't you kind of run out of time. But I did all that and a lot of what I learned in 4-H are, the, are some of the most there are 
I'll put it this way. I learned a hell of a lot more in 4-H that I use now than I ever did what I, learned, right? in, what I learned in college. I mean, yeah. I learned public speaking. I learned, you know, how to you know keep a record book. I learned all these things that, That's that, great. that still get used now. Yeah. Whereas, I mean, how often do you, you know, think about if you go think about your college education, I mean, realistically, how much of your college do you actually ever go back? At? I would always ask, I had a question. They say, what? I said, how does this apply to the real world? And they would just go, what? You know, yeah. the teachers look at me and I went, no, really? Yeah. yeah. Or, well, what am I going to do? Quadra, you know, quadra angles and stuff in the real world, you know? No, I mean, and for some vocations, I mean, that's certainly necessary. Yeah, but for, I'm going to be an academic, I guess, you know, or something. But for, but for but for most people, I think what you learn in in 4-H and FFA and, the, and those values that you learn, right? Leadership. I mean, the the you know your your you know your head for clear thinking, your you know your heart for your loyal. I mean, all the things that you learn, the 4-H is this, you know that they're actually there. Right. Those are the things that really matter in the real world and, sure. and, and those relationships. Oh, I 100% I agree. You know, if you go into an inner city school, now, you know, you, you grew up where, you know, in the farmland and it's dissipated. So if you go in an inner city, you know, like, and, and you go into a classroom and you say, how many of you, I mean, you can go in every classroom. How many of you want to be farmers when you grow up? No hands. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, do you even know what that is? You know, and and you're you're that's what you're gonna get because there's no education. You know, it's like, well, what do you want to be? I don't most of them don't even know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, there there's no leadership, like you said, programs to, you know, get people ready for yeah, for the, or you know, for the, the real, real world. world. Yeah, exactly. yeah, get hit in the face with that. And it, it, it's a hard, cold thing you, you get hit with. Let's get into, uh, uh, oh, you, you do a, a lot of pollinating things too, don't you? Uh, and, and in the context of wolf, you mean? Yeah. So we have a lot of different, we work with a lot of different technological companies. Yeah, so we, cool. we, yeah, we want to, I mean, we like to be at the forefront of, you know, technology of, of kind of pushing the envelope, which is, you know, it comes with its own set of challenges, yeah. of course. But yeah, I mean, we do some stuff with, uh, we, where we have like the, uh, pollinator uh, partnership, uh, which is, you know, making sure we keep a, a, a population of native bees. Yeah. That's really on cool. On the ranch. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah it is. That's a really neat thing. And and you guys do solar farming too. So we have some we have some solar that that's really tried to kind of offset our uh, oh pump costs. Yeah, yeah, the the cost of our pumping and things like that. The 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 issue or the challenge I should say is because our our water supply is so variable that I remember I'm thinking back. You know, there were a lot of folks in Westlands that that still wanted to use groundwater because they had their solar. Well, this, it, the cost of our surface water supply ended up being priced so high that it ended up being cheaper because people had put in solar. They wanted to use their groundwater, yeah. even, which is why it's important to keep you know surface water costs sure. reasonable as well to make sure that people you know are able to, to use those supplies. Yeah, yeah, that's a neat thing. I mean, you know, they say farmers, people don't realize they're constantly you have to innovate. Yeah, yeah. You know, to stay in the business because of regulatories and, and this and that, you know, which is incredible. So let's get a little bit into the water deal here. Sure. What, you know, they're looking at doing some things, but, you know, I I looked at the uh, Sacramento, you know, San Joaquin Delta, and mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a huge issue right there in itself, right? Mm-hmm. And you know they're they're pushing a lot of water in the ocean, and um, I was talking to a person in Shasta down. They've been working on doing these plants for thirty years. They, I think any water project they work on. I mean, well, any construction in general in California, right? It seems yeah. like they work on it for, for yeah, years. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, there. So I mean. It's just amazing what a little, you know, tweak if you were to raise Shasta Dam, you know, just a few feet, yeah. you know, for instance, what how much more water that could mean and and what environmental benefits there could be because you would have that cold water pool, which is really the big hindrance right now is of of being able to turn over our dams and, as they were designed to do. Right. Is because you have to maintain so much cold water, which means a, a higher water level maintained throughout the year in, you know, some of these dam projects like Shasta. Uh, because there has to be so much cold water lower that they can release when they want, you know, salmon to to come sure. and do their spawning activities and things like that. This uh, this article I was reading, and this was just recently, and they were saying, yeah, we don't need any water storage. It's like what? You know, you, these things. It, it's been thirty years. Do you mm -hmm. know how much the population has grown in thirty years? It's doubled. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, and, and you know how much water people people are the biggest pollu you know polluters of water if you if you you know want to talk that route, and, and how much more water is used because there's. 30 more million people or something? Well, know? I mean, you think about it, the water system was designed for 20 million people. Right. And so, I mean, that and that was kind of their forecast. That was a long range thought back, you know, back when we still, you know, did build projects and, and you yeah. know, built conveyance and things like that back in, you know, the, the 60s. Um, that was they were forward thinking enough to say, hey, you know, at some point California is going to get to 20 million people. Let's build for the next 15 to 20 years, and and then you know the next generation of people can build for 30 million people and so on down the road. Uh, but then we just stopped. It never got built, yeah. right? And like I said, that that you know that anything beyond that just never really happened. And so, I mean, we could use our existing resources a lot more effectively and efficiently, and have a better water supply if we were to use them more efficiently. Uh, but we're still short of storage. I mean, at the, oh, at the end of the day, sure. whether whether it's above ground or below ground, we have to find ways to store water a lot better. Yeah, I think it was uh, sixteen feet on the Shasta. Or something like that. I believe it's eighteen, yeah. But eighteen, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, eighteen yeah. feet, yeah. And it was just a ridiculous amount of water, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, yeah. acre feet, yeah. You know, and, and, and it was like, whoa, you know. Uh, then um, I, I read an article about the uh, Cadiz Valley. Okay, yeah. I, did, did you hear about that? I'm a little. I'm kind of familiar with that. So it, yeah, they're interesting too, and it's it's really deep because. They get all this water runoff into an aquifer into this valley, and it, it, it it's huge. I mean, it, the aquifer, and it's self-sustaining because every year the snow snow melt and everything, mm. and they're not using it. So anyway, they get all this permission and stuff, and I guess Trump, he okayed it. He put it on a fast track, and then they have a, a oil and gas line running from the valley into the Bakersfield um, uh, water source there. And now they're suing them because they're calling it an EPA issue because there's no oil and gas coming through it. They're going to put water through it. <laughs> It's amazing what people can use. And like I said, I'm not I'm not familiar with the ins and outs that much yeah. of, of, of the Cadiz piece of things. But I mean, it's just amazing how good, well-intentioned laws like, I mean, CEQA and, and some of the NEPA things, you know, those are well-intentioned laws to try to protect, you know, our resources, right? To protect, you know, animals and, 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 our, and our natural resources as well. But I don't think they were meant to be used as, as hurdles. It was meant to be you know, you, we have to be thoughtful of our environment and, and take into consideration, but it didn't mean you should never build anything, yeah. right? I mean, that's that's what it's been used for, though. And it's amazing how sometimes it gets used now on the other side, of, you know, on the other side, people have flipped it and said, well, we're just going to delay even things that have environmental benefits just because we don't agree with it sometimes. Absolutely. Things like, you know, uh, desalination plants and things like that. It's like, no, wait, we're going <laughs> to we're going to use these, you know, these state and federal laws to circumvent and and prevent you guys from building anything that's going to help, you know, potentially would help mitigate some of these water issues. Yeah, if we had like two nuclear desalination plants, one in LA and one in San Francisco, we wouldn't have half the a third of the issues that we're having. You know, and they're like, well, nuclear, you know, is blah blah blah. Well, do you know how many nuclear battleships and missile silos? And if you if you knew, you'd go, oh wow. <laughs> You know, these things are benefiting you. you know? Yeah. So, and, and the regulatory issues are just, they're unbelievable to build those. Desalination, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, Dubai and everything, they have them. Yeah, and, Israel. You know, they got no water. Yeah. You know, they got like two and a half inches a year of water. <laughs> so, you know, what do you do, you know? And it's safe. It's like these nuclear things, they, they aren't 50, 60 years old nuclear things anymore. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, you know, it, it's not the Eisenhower administration no, you know, trying to do these no, things. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's completely different in everything, you know. So, you know, I think that's our biggest. You know, if you looked at challenges, you know, what, what do we have in the farming? You know, people drive and they go, "Wow, I can't believe I went from San Francisco to L.A. and I couldn't believe all the farmland." How do you think you eat? <laughs> Well, I mean, that's that's the that's the scary thing, though, is, I mean, you think you look at some of these reports, you know, based on, you know, the changes coming with Sigma. And I mean, 
uh, I mean, you're talking potentially a half million to a million, you know, acres of farmland going away. Yeah. There's only 8 million acres of farmland in the state. Yeah. So, I mean, if a million of it goes away, that's 12%. It's, it's, it's a lot. That's, that's a lot. It's, yeah. it's a huge amount of, of, of change and a huge, you know, imp, you know, up, up, upending of our, uh, of yeah. our food system. I remember uh, talking with the, uh, the PEX about the uh, selenium. And mm. we were just kids partying. This was 32, 33 years ago. And that, and they started doing it then. Mm -hmm. you know. And it finally is now resolved. But it's resolved. Now you got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. you know. So how many more years is it going to take to fix it? Not in my lifetime. I, or I, mine either. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. But, it's, yeah. but I think a lot of it has become self I mean, because we've become so much more efficient, you just don't have that same amount of, of runoff. Or oh, absolutely. Like that. Yeah, so it's, it's all different. Now. It's, a, it's a completely yeah. different, you know, you know, kettle of fish that we're dealing with yeah, here. Yeah. Because, again, farmers have grown and adapted and, and made the changes that we need to, you know, to, to operate within the constraints that we're given here. Yeah. It, it, it takes such a long time for people to react. That That's our issue. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have... I, I don't know. They, they, there's a bunch of money being put in... Um, restructuring our infrastructure now and, and i'm you know wondering if is that are you going to do anything about the farmer's water you know i i don't know mm -hmm. do you, i mean do you have any clue about what they're doing you mean on the state side of things yeah or, yeah i mean really what we need to have is just you know that we talk about these voluntary agreements and which would be beneficial for fish and for farmers as right. well so you could be much more targeted I think what farmers want is just more certainty, right? Sure. I mean, you're, if you're talking about planning like a long-term investment, like planting vines or oh. planting trees and things like that, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-decade. Yeah. yeah. And so you just want to have some sort of, you know, a little bit of certainty going into that. And so if you, if you don't have that, it's, you know, it's a huge challenge and it's a huge issue when people just don't want to come to the table just because they they just don't want to work together. And so there's these, you know, these lawsuits and people don't want to work on these voluntary agreements that would, you know, make the timing be better for the fish. Right. And then not have us waste as much water per se, uh, going out to the ocean in times when, you know, when we don't need to, when it doesn't need to be flowing like that. And I just don't understand why, why is that so hard to, to work towards, to have something that's mutually beneficial? It's not. It, it, it's almost like people don't like farmers. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but the, th but the, thing, but the yeah. thing the thing of it is, is there's a very small and very vocal you know cabal of people that yeah. that don't that don't like farmers or don't think we should be farming. I know. But if you look at like poll and you know just poll after poll of people who are the most trusted people, what is the most trusted profession? Farmers are always one or two on that list sure. of people that are most trusted. Yeah. And I just don't understand how how we've let the microphone be, you know, by taken by some by folks that you know just that don't like the industry, don't like farmers, when all we want to do is just grow food. That's yeah. that's all we want to do. Yeah, is, yeah. <laughs> well, well, look, you got to eat, right? And we're growing the food, and, and all we want is a projection, you know. Yeah. And, and and people they just don't understand that. Yeah. And, and I don't get it. I encourage farmers all the time and, and I'm, and I'm probably, I'm probably just as guilty of it as not as, as other people are of not doing it. But I mean, to tell our stories though, and to talk about the good things we're doing, sure. right? There's a lot of great things that farmers do, you know, within communities to, Absolutely. to, to help out. Um, gosh, I remember back, you know, I, I used to be a member of our, of our local lions club, you know, before, you know, I had, before my kids got older and I had so many other things going yeah. on. Uh, but when I was president of, of Easton lions club, you know, just the, the communities of Easton and Crothers and Riverdale, which is almost all farmers in, in those communities, got together. We raised like $110,000 for, for wounded veterans, right? People, you know, this is, you know, people coming back after, you know, the Iraq war. Yeah. But that's what the power of communities do. And that's sure. the power of, you know, small farms, you know, well, farms in general, but farms, small communities coming together. And that and that's just how we work. And it's crazy to me sometimes that people don't don't have that understanding or have this misguided view that, it, well, it's all just corporate agriculture. Well, yeah, a lot of farms are corporations for legal reasons. Or, oh, yeah, you know, just like every other, yeah. Right, I mean, any a lot of small businesses are corporations. I mean, just for, you know, for protections and things like that. Um, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, it's, you know, it's Procter and Gamble coming in and, you know, owning your farm or something like that. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it, my, my farm is 40 acres and we're a corporation. It's yeah. just, you oh, know. Yeah, yeah, you got to protect yourself from yeah. the corporation. Well, you know, you look at taxes on $7 billion. 
Mm -hmm. just here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's a lot of Midwest stuff all over the United States. Yeah. I mean, just here. One in three people are related in some way to farming Mm -hmm. as far as unemployment. Or employment, I'm sorry. Right, yeah. Which is, you know, that's huge. So you're looking at 33% if if you're going those routes, you know. So well, you start doing the math though. I mean, if, if you talk about you know thirty, you know, I think I've I've heard one in four. So it's one that's somewhere between one and three, one to yeah, four, right? Yeah. Jobs are t- are tied to agriculture, and now you're looking at twelve percent reduction in the amount of farmland that, that's Ooh. that's done. That has an, that's a real impact on the jobs that are within a community. Yeah, that's I mean that's 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 huge, right? Yeah. I mean that's one out of eight. So now I mean I, I don't want to sit here and try to do the math. On, you know, I know, on a, no, no, no. thing, but it's yeah. it's a, it's, a, it's a big chunk of people that yeah. are that are employed that are going to be impacted if if we don't kind of fix our water system yeah, here. People better buck up and. Uh, educate themselves and listen to people like yourself you know educated people who know what's going on anyway i appreciate what uh you're doing and i'm impressed with your organization san wolf and uh, prison farm bureau and everything else awesome. so uh, it's a pleasure speaking to you pleasure to you i'm pat simone thanks for watching please donate five to ten dollars to our patreon account and uh, we'll be able to expand and go further with this thank you